Hi learners, it's M from Sano Nerds, and this video is on Unit 18, Hemodynamics. Unit 18, Hemodynamics. Hemodynamics is the study of blood as it moves through the circulatory system. And understanding hemodynamics is really gonna help us understand Doppler. So there are two important ideas that we wanna keep in mind as we learn about hemodynamics. First, volume flow rate. Now, sometimes we'll just refer to this as flow rate or even just flow. But we are interested in knowing how much blood is moving through any given point of the circulatory system. Typically, we're going to express this as a volume over time, kind of like gallons per second or milliliters per second. And we also want to understand the idea of velocity. Now, velocity is going to apply a little bit more in the next unit when we learn about Doppler. Where volume flow rate asks the question, how much, velocity is going to ask the question, how fast blood is flowing through any given point in the circulatory system. Now, velocity is going to recognize a speed and a direction. So the speed part of this is expressed as a distance over time, like centimeters per second. The direction, at least in ultrasound, is usually going to refer to towards the transducer or away. Another example, speed, could be expressed as 50 miles per hour, where velocity would be 50 miles per hour heading east. Velocity needs a direction. So in this unit, we are going to really be focusing on hemodynamics of blood. And in section 18.1, we're gonna focus on the flow of fluid in general. So studying hemodynamics really takes a lot of cues from fluid dynamics. And that's because the vessels in the body are basically just a big system of pipes with a slightly thicker fluid, blood flowing through them. Now the heart is going to act as a pump that propels the fluid through the body. The blood is susceptible to extrinsic physical forces such as pressure, resistance, and size of the tube or vessel in our case. And this is going to change how the blood flows. So we need to know how these physical properties affect blood flowing through the body and how the body can affect the flow both in how much is flowing and how it is flowing. Now there are a few key terms that you should be familiar with as we talk about how fluid flows. The first one is viscosity. Now viscosity is the resistance of a fluid to flow. So viscosity is going to describe the thickness of the fluid. So if you think about pouring water out of a pitcher and pouring honey out of a pitcher, which one would allow more to flow over one minute, giving us that volume flow rate? Well, the water, which has low viscosity, flows very easily compared to the honey, which has a high viscosity, would flow very slowly. So again, viscosity is the resistance of fluid to flow. You can think of how thick is the fluid, the thicker it is, the more resistance it's going to have to moving or to flowing. And it'll be important to remember that viscosity is expressed in units of poise. And because we're learning about hemodynamics, let's bring it back to the discussion around blood. So average blood is about five times thicker than water. However, there are medical conditions that can change the thickness of the blood by changing the amount of red blood cells. Anemia, which means few red blood cells, and is shown on the image to the right, is going to cause the blood to be thinner or less viscous because it has fewer solid components in it. Opposite of that then is polycythemia, which means too many red blood cells. And this is going to cause the blood to be thicker or more viscous. Again, that's because it has more solid components. It's going to resist flow more. A blood test called hematocrit is going to tell us the percentage of blood that is made up of red blood cells. So a high hematocrit lean itself more to polycythemia, where a low hematocrit is going to be more anemia. The next concept that I need you to understand is pressure. And pressure in the circulatory system in fluid dynamics is the driving force behind fluid flow. So for fluid to move, for fluid to flow, there must be a pressure difference. When we're measuring pressure, we're usually going to use a units of force per unit of area. So we've already learned about Pascal's. But another example would be like the air pressure in our tires. That's pounds, that's your force, per square inch. That's your area, so force per unit area, pounds per square inch. So if we imagine a tube 
that represents our circulatory system, and we have a certain amount of pressure on one side and a certain amount of pressure on the other side, if those pressures are equal, we are not going to see any flow. There must be a difference of pressure for fluid to flow. So equal pressures result in no flow. However, when we're talking about our circulatory system, we have two main sources that are going to exert pressure on the system, being the heart and gravity. So now when we increase the pressure on one side of the tube, and that could be either by raising it or pushing on it like a pump would, we would now create a pressure gradient. So that pressure gradient is the difference between pressure on one side of the tube to pressure on the other side. The gradient is the difference between the two. Fluid is going to flow from high pressure to low pressure, and it's also going to flow from high resistance to low resistance. So if we look back at our tube, if we raise one end of it, we're putting more gravitational energy into the system, and we are going to see a pressure difference between pressure one and pressure two. Now, if pressure one is greater than pressure two, we're going to see the flow move towards pressure two, high pressure to low pressure. Same idea with the pump. If we've got force on one side of the tube, that is going to push the fluid to the lesser pressure on the other end of the tube. So fluid will only flow when there is a pressure gradient, which means a change or a difference in pressures on either end of the tube. The last term that I want to make sure that we cover is volumetric flow rate. And yes, we did already touch on this, but we are working towards one of our first formulas related to flow, so I just want to make sure we cover it again. Remember that volumetric flow rate is sometimes just referred to as flow, and it's the amount of blood that passes a point in the system over a certain amount of time. Another example that we can use is when we think about our faucets. We consider an output of about one gallon per minute to be adequate flow in our homes. So volumetric flow rate uses units of milliliters per minute or maybe milliliters per second, some sort of volume over time. The adult cardiac output is actually about 5,000 milliliters per minute and with five liters or so in the body, which is equal to 5,000 milliliters, it takes about one minute for all of your blood to circulate and return to the heart. So if we were to look at any one point in the circulatory system, we would see on average a flow rate of about 5,000 milliliters per minute. And that is going to bring us to our first formula in this unit. This is the formula for flow rate, also known as just flow or volume flow rate. Now this formula does assume a long straight tube. Our circulatory system is not a long straight tube, but it helps us to predict what is going to occur in the tubes in our bodies. The other thing I want you to note is that the triangle next to the P is the Greek letter delta, and that means change. So if you remember when we were talking about our pressure gradient, that was the change in pressure from one end to the other. That's what's being expressed in this formula. It's the change in pressure from one end of the tube to the other end. So when we look at this formula, we see that Q is our volume flow rate. That is what Q stands for, and it's measured in milliliters per second. P, again, stands for pressure, and this is going to be measured in some sort of force over area, for example, a dyne per centimeter squared. Lastly, then, we have R, which stands for resistance, and again, this is measured in poise. So volume flow rate is equal to the change in pressure divided by the resistance. Knowing our formula relationships, we can confidently say that when the change in pressure increases, we are going to see that the flow rate will also increase, and that is because the numerator and the quotient are directly related to one another. And this is true if you think about it. If you are slowly pouring water out of a pitcher and you just kind of have it lifted a little bit, you can get a small little trickle of water coming out of that pitcher. However, you raise the pitcher almost upside down, you can get a very large amount to come out. You're increasing your flow. When you change from that horizontal position to more of the vertical position, you're increasing the change in the pressure gradient. So when there is a larger difference between pressure one and pressure two, 
that's that change in pressure, we're going to see more flow. Now, opposite of that, if we were to increase our resistance, we are going to see a decrease in the flow rate. And this kind of goes back to our honey versus water example. Water has very low resistance, so that would be a decrease in resistance. Therefore, we'd see an increase in flow rate. However, honey is very viscous, a lot more resistance, so that resistance is going to increase, and then we see a decrease in the rate of flow. So we can say that resistance and flow rate are inversely related, and we know that again because the denominator and the quotient are always inversely related. Now there is a little bit more to the resistance, the R, that we can discuss and learn a little bit more about. There is a formula that just relates back to the resistance or the R from that previous formula. So if we break that down, we can say that resistance is now equal to eight multiplied by the length of the tube, multiplied by viscosity, which is divided by pi multiplied by the radius of the tube to the fourth power. Now I know this is a lot to take in. We're gonna break this down you do not need to memorize this, but we do need to understand the concepts. So let's just look at this formula again, look at what all the symbols mean. Again, R, the capital R, stands for resistance. It is equal to eight, which is a constant, so that's just gonna stay the same, multiplied by the length of the tube. So if we have a longer tube or a short tube, that's gonna affect the resistance. Now we're gonna multiply that by the viscosity of the fluid in the tube. So increase viscosity, decrease viscosity. We need to know what happens with that. And that viscosity is divided by pi, which is again another constant, multiplied by the radius of the tube to the fourth power. And again, we need to know what happens when we change the radius of the tube. So length, viscosity and radius are all going to affect the resistance that we see in this tube. So again, you do not need to know the resistance formula, but we do want to know how length, viscosity, and radius are going to affect flow rate. So let's take a look through it. If we increase the viscosity, that is going to increase our resistance. And when we increase our resistance, we decrease the flow rate. So thicker fluid makes more resistance, which makes less flow of the fluid. If we increase the length of the tube, that is also going to increase resistance, which decreases the flow rate. So a longer tube is going to cause more resistance, which decreases the amount of flow. An example of the length affecting our flow rate would be your garden hose pull it out for the first time, connect it to the house, and you turn it on. And if you have a really, really short hose, that water is gonna come out almost immediately. You're going to have a large volume over a short amount of time coming out of the hose. Compare that to, to a very long hose, maybe 50, 100 foot hose, you're gonna see a very low trickle, low volume coming out of the hose initially. So the length of the tube increases resistance, which is going to decrease the rate of flow. Lastly then, when we decrease the radius of the tube, that is going to increase our resistance. So smaller tubes, bigger resistance. When we increase our resistance, we see a decrease in flow. So again, small tubes, more resistance, low flow. Again, we can compare this to hoses your garden hose compared to a fire hose. Your garden hose is not going to put out a four alarm fire. That's why we've got giant fire hoses so it can move a lot of water in a short amount of time. So small hoses, more resistance, less flow. So now if we combine the volumetric flow rate, which was Q being equal to the change in pressure divided by resistance and our resistance equation, which we learned was resistance multiplied by eight by the length, multiplied by viscosity divided by pi, multiplied by the radius to the fourth, we get what we call the Poiseuille equation.
And by using the Poiset equation, we can start to make very educated guesses about how blood is going to behave in the body. There are a couple formats that you might say the Poiset equation in. The first one on top here, we are using radius, just like we did for the resistance equation, but it can also be expressed using diameter. And that just changes some of our constant numbers, 8 to 128. Either is correct, and in the end, the same concepts are true for both. So let's take a look at those. And we're going to see the same pattern that we see in all of our other formulas. So here's our big takeaway from the Poiset equation. If we increase length, then we are going to decrease our flow rate. If we increase viscosity, then we decrease our flow rate. If we increase our pressure gradient, then we increase the flow rate. And lastly, if diameter or radius increase, then we also see an increase in the flow rate. So of the equations to memorize or to spend a little bit more time with, understand that the volumetric flow rate Q equals change in pressure over resistance combined with what resistance equation is gives us Poiset's equation and here's where we're really going to see those extra factors from the body, how they affect flow rate within the tubes of our vessels. Now, out of all of these takeaways from looking at the Poiset equation, the biggest one really is this last one here, that if we increase the radius or increase the diameter, we're going to see an increase in flow rate. And that is something that physiologically happens in our bodies. We have arterioles which are very, very, very tiny arteries, kind of the last thing before connecting to capillaries and transitioning into veins. Now the arterioles, as all arteries do, the arterioles do as well, have muscular walls, and these can either relax or they contract. And when they relax, they make the diameter bigger. When they contract, they make the diameter smaller. And this is a fantastic tool that the body has to control the rate of flow of blood into certain organs. By changing the diameter, the body can either increase or decrease the flow of blood to an organ. Now, for example, when we eat, we want to use our intestines. Our intestines need to help digest all that food, get our nutrients, and circulate that around the body. So the blood vessels that supply the intestines are going to dilate, increase their diameter, or increase their radius, which is going to increase the amount of flow that travels to them. Once we're done digesting, we don't need to have as much blood flow going to the intestines. We just need enough to keep the tissue alive. So the vessels are going to contract on themselves, thus decreasing the flow rate. One last little side note then about Posey's equation then is that Posey's equation assumes laminar flow. And we're going to learn what laminar flow is next. So section 18.2, types of flow. Now there are really two distinct ways in which we want to look at how blood flows through the body. First, we want to know how do streamlines of blood flow within a vessel? And then we also want to know how does the heart or respiration affect that blood flow? The streamlines of the blood is going to relate back to some basic principles of fluid dynamics, but we're going to see it applied to blood flow as well. When we take a look at how the heart or respiration affects blood flow, that's going to be directly related to the physiology of the body, what vessel are we looking at, and how do these extrinsic factors affect the blood flow. So let's first take a look at how those streamlines affect flow within the vessels. So there are two types of flow that you need to know, laminar and turbulent flow. Now laminar flow is broken down into three more categories. We have plug, parabolic, and disturbed. Now we're going to take a look at each of these individually, but first we need to define what streamlines are. When fluid flows, it has streamlines. These streamlines you can think of as kind of layers of fluid that are flowing through the area. By observing these streamlines, we can now categorize the type of flow that we are seeing. So if we see all streamlines or all layers traveling parallel, straight, and at the same speed, we would say that this is laminar plug flow. Quite often we see laminar plug flow at the beginning of vessels. 
as that fluid travels into the vessel, those outer layers are going to start to slow down due to friction. And then that next innermost layer has some friction with the outermost layer and the next layer and the next layer and next layer until what we end up seeing is the very central portion of the vessel ends up being the fastest moving part of the blood because it has the least amount of resistance. So when we see parallel, straight, and varying speed streamlines, we are going to call this laminar parabolic flow. The parabolic part comes from looking at the profile of those streamlines, how they look in the blood, and you'll notice that they make a slight curve along the front here. That is a parabola, so we call this parabolic flow. As blood flows through a vessel, it may encounter a branch or a slight narrowing. And this can cause parallel but not quite straight streamlines. We might see same speeds and we might see more of the parabolic speeds. But the biggest point on this one is that they are not straight. And when we see those parallel not straight streamlines, we are looking at laminar disturbed flow. And we most often see this, again, near little disturbances or branching of the vessels. So the big thing we've seen with laminar flow up until this point is that it is parallel streamlines. Now when we look at streamlines and they become chaotic, we call that turbulent flow. The streamlines are not well organized or even really well seen. There's going to be swirling of the blood, which we call eddies or vortices. We typically still see forward flow but it can be at different speeds, different directions, and we're most commonly going to see turbulent flow following flow that is extremely fast. And very fast flow tends to occur in a severe stenosis. So when we see a severe narrowing of the vessel, as the blood comes out of that narrowing, that is most likely where we will see that turbulent flow. So again, blood is coming in to the stenosis or to the narrowing, it's going to start to change directions, change speeds through that narrowing. And right as it comes out of it and enters back into a wide open vessel, we are going to see very chaotic, turbulent, swirling blood. And that's the turbulent flow. That's the chaotic eddies and vortices. The blood is still moving forward, but it can have some different speeds and swirls and backwards motion. Very chaotic. Eventually, as that blood continues down the vessel, it will return to some sort of probably parabolic flow, but it does take a little bit of time for that turbulent flow to normalize back into our parabolic flow. Now, the interesting thing between laminar flow and turbulent flow is that they sound different. So laminar flow is actually relatively silent. When blood is flowing smoothly through a vessel, you really can't hear it. And think about sitting next to a calm, peaceful river. You don't really hear much of the river flowing through, but you can see that it's moving. Compare that though then to turbulent flow, which is actually pretty loud. When you are sitting next to maybe a rapids or if there's a waterfall, that's loud. You can hear the water flowing through that area. And the same is true when we're listening to blood flowing through the body. Now, if we take a stethoscope and listen to a patient's carotid artery in their neck, or sometimes we listen to abdominal vessels, or even the heart, we can hear that turbulent flow. And when we can hear the turbulent flow, it's called a bruit. So B-R-U-I-T, bruit. And it has a very kind of wind blowing sound to it. It's more like <laughs> and it's going to go along with the heartbeat as the pulse is going by. You can hear this kind of turbulent flow within it. Now, what's also interesting is that you can feel certain types of turbulent flow. For example, when patients have dialysis grafts, those are a connection between an artery and a vein, typically in the arm. Where those two connect causes very turbulent flow. And if you were to put your hand in that area, you can feel the vibrations of that turbulent flow. So when you can feel turbulent flow, we call it a thrill. So again, if you can hear it, it's a brewy. If you can feel it, 
it's a thrill. Now in the next unit, we're going to learn more about spectral tracings, which is the image that you can see on your screen now. And spectral tracings are the result of performing a pulse wave Doppler. And the white line that you can see there represents individual blood cells that the machine is detecting the reflection of. When we see the laminar flow observed on a vessel with spectral tracing, it's going to show a very thin line. Again, most of those red blood cells are traveling at or near the same speed. We're getting that parabolic flow. So they're going to be very similar. It's going to be a nice organized line of blood going through there. And laminar is the normal physiological state of blood. If a vessel is wide open, we expect to see laminar flow through it. However, when that turbulent flow is observed with spectral tracing, we're going to show a line that starts to fill in as there's red blood cells traveling at all different speeds, all different directions, causing turbulent flow to be visible in our spectral tracing. So as you can see in this image, we no longer have that nice, smooth, clear, open window through here. We've now filled this in with spectral tracing information. And this is a visual representation of turbulent flow. And again, we typically see turbulent flow like these after a critical stenosis in a vessel or in a valve of the heart. Another concept that we look at when we are looking at laminar versus turbulent flow is something called Reynolds number. Now Reynolds number is a unitless number and it can predict the type of flow that will be present. It's going to take into consideration the velocity the density and the viscosity of the blood moving through a radius of the tube. So yes, there is a formula for it, but I don't even want to show it to you because it is absolutely unnecessary. What you need to know is what the numbers mean. So again, remember Reynolds number unitless, and it's going to give us a value that predicts laminar or turbulent flow. So if we see a value of Reynolds number less than 1500, we know we have laminar flow. If we see a value between 1500 and 2000, it's kind of indeterminate. It could be shifting towards turbulent flow. It could just be kind of a disturbed flow, but we're not real sure at this point. Once Reynolds number goes over 2000, then we are predicting turbulent flow through the area. So as a review, laminar versus turbulent flow parallel streamlines. They can be going the same speed. That's plug. Parabolic has the center going a little bit faster or disturbed, which changes the direction, making them not quite straight anymore. But the big part about laminar is that they are parallel streamlines. Turbulent then is very chaotic flow, blood flowing in all different directions. Streamlines basically gone. We're going to see vortices and eddies with the turbulent flow. Laminar is very smooth. It is normal for blood flow to be laminar. We expect laminar flow in most of our vessels. Turbulent flow typically is due to some sort of pathology. So this is at a stenosis, either in the vessel or of a valve. Laminar flow is typically silent, where turbulent flow is very loud. Laminar is predicted by a less than 1500 Reynolds number value, where turbulent is going to be over 2000. So now that we know the type of flow that we are going to see really in any vessels, we can see turbulent flow in veins, we can see turbulent flow in arteries, probably a little bit more common in arterial high pressure flow. But now that we know the laminar and turbulent flow, now we can discuss how our anatomy then begins to affect the flow in the blood as well. So when we consider the vessels in how blood is flowing, we have three common types of flow that we see. So we can have pulsatile flow, which you are seeing here. That pulsatile flow refers to blood that's going to move at different velocities. It's typically caused by cardiac contractions, and because of that, we are going to most likely see pulsatile flow in the arteries. Pulsatile flow is most likely going to have a very high flow rate, and that's very much in relationship to the heart and the high pressure that comes along with it. So if we look at this diagram here, we have a spectral tracing and then a diagram of the spectral tracing showing the variable velocities. This baseline here is no flow, 
So we are seeing a change or an increase in flow in one direction. Then we see the flow come back a different direction. And then we see the flow go forward again in a different direction coming back. And so you'll see kind of these forward movements and backward movements, forward movements, backward movements as the heart contracts. This is during systole. You get that strong heart contraction, lots of pressure, forces the blood forward. As the heart relaxes, we're going to switch into diastole. This is usually going to cause the blood to flow backwards a little bit. We've lost all that pressure that was moving it forward. So we see a little bit, bit of backwards flow. And then we're going to see either like a rebound of the vessel or a closing of the valve in the heart, which might cause a little bit more forward flow again. So anytime you're seeing an increase, decrease, increase, decrease, increase, decrease, we call that pulsatile flow. And this is going to be giant increases that match up with the cardiac contractions. So that's the big part. Pulsatile flow, cardiac contractions, usually seen in arteries. Now we also have something called phasic flow. Phasic flow is also going to have blood that's moving at variable velocities, but this is going to be much more related to respiration when we breathe in and breathe out. And because it's related to respiration, we typically see this type of flow in veins, usually a very low flow rate and low pressure with phasic flow. So again, in this diagram, we have a spectral tracing of phasic flow, and then we also have just a schematic drawing of it as well. And again, what we're seeing is the baseline here. This is the baseline here. And because this specific example is in the leg, as the patient exhales, we're going to see an increase in flow. So we're still seeing a variability in the velocities of flow that are occurring here. And as they inhale, we see the cessation or even backwards flow of blood. And then as they exhale, the blood will move forward again. When it's closer to the baseline, it's moving slower. As the graph makes it further away from the baseline, those are going to be increased velocities. So we see with the breathing, a change in the velocities of the blood flowing. Again, this is typically caused by respiration because respiration changes the pressure variance in our chest and in our abdominal cavity. And it's going to most likely affect the veins as they are bringing blood back to the heart because they are less affected by the cardiac contractions. So this is all occurring at the same time that the arteries are more affected by the pulsatile cardiac contractions. So again, phasic flow is most likely going to be in veins, and we're going to see variable velocities that match up more with respiration. Now there's a third type of blood flow that we see in vessels, and that's called steady flow. And this is going to be when blood is moving at a constant speed. Again, we have our pulse wave tracing or our spectral tracing and then a diagram of it. The baseline would represent no flow, but we can see that we have reflections of blood cells that are moving at a pretty constant 20 centimeters per second. So steady flow is when we see very little variation. It's relatively constant. And this is typically going to be in, seen in veins while holding your breath. So if a person were to take a breath in and hold it, that blood still needs to get back to the heart. So the blood will continue flowing forward at a relatively constant speed. Another really common vessel that shows steady flow with a breath in is the portal vein. That's a big vein that heads to the liver. So steady flow is not as commonly seen, but it is a type of flow that we can see within vessels. All of the types of flow that we talked about, laminar, turbulent, disturbed, parabolic, those can happen in pulsatile, or it can happen in steady, or it can happen in phasic. So you can have phasic, laminar, parabolic flow, or you can have phasic, turbulent flow. It all depends on how the blood is flowing through the tube and typically what tube it's in in relationship to our body. Well, section 18.3, energy. Now we talked about needing a pressure gradient or a difference in pressure for fluid to flow. That pressure is actually related back to energy that is within the circulatory system. The heart, when it's relaxed, is going to fill the left ventricle and the muscles are kind of static, holding what we call potential energy. Once the left ventricle contracts, it takes the potential energy in the muscles, squeezes, 
transferring that potential energy into pressure and kinetic energy. That potential energy is then transferred into pressure and kinetic energy into the circulatory system. Now, as the blood moves through the body, some of that pressure energy and kinetic energy are going to be converted into other types of energy. So it's going to exit the circulatory system and be converted into other types of energy. So we need to spend a little bit of time understanding how energy is transferred in the circulatory system. Now, one of the really big pieces of energy is the law of conservation. And that tells us that energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transformed. So again, if we think about the heart and the energy that it provides to the circulatory system, it's providing the forward momentum for the circulatory system. And that energy that the heart has just didn't come out of nowhere. It was transformed from the food that we ate and the bodily functions that we have and the ions moving in between things and electrical energy that comes from that. And so there's all this energy always in the world. None of it has been created out of nothing and none of it's been destroyed. We just keep transforming it. So the energy in the heart, in the muscles, transforms from this like muscular energy, pushing on the blood, making it kinetic energy. That kinetic energy is going to go through the circulatory system, causing the blood to move. And so we see energy constantly being transformed, and then eventually we'll put more food in our body and more processes will happen and energy will be restored to the circulatory system through the heart and all this stuff again. So again, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed. And a really common way that we like to display this is something called a Newton's cradle, which you can see on your screen now. So as the ball is pulled back and released, it goes from potential energy to kinetic energy. The ball is moving. Anytime something's moving, it has kinetic energy. As that ball is moving, it has momentum, and that energy is transferred to the next ball, which is transferred to the next ball to the next ball. And then we see it being transferred to the last ball, which kicks it out, providing that kinetic energy almost at the same rate as the energy that the first ball had. And so we see that the energy was conserved through all those elements, eventually giving kinetic energy to the last ball. Well, as that ball travels up, is affected by gravity, that kinetic energy is transferred to potential energy for just like a brief fraction of a second. As it falls back to Earth, it gathers kinetic energy again, and then the whole process starts over. And it transfers through all the balls and makes the other side kick out. Now, eventually, we know that friction and momentum will be lost from this system because it's been transferred to some sort of energy, typically heat, outside of the system. So eventually this will stop because we don't have perpetual motion machines. So all of this is to introduce us to the idea that even though our heart and gravity are providing energy into the circulatory system, it is going to lose some energy to transformation. So there are three types of transformation or energy loss that we see from the circulatory system. The three most common ways that we lose that energy due to transformation are going to be viscous loss, frictional loss, and inertial loss. Now viscous loss should sound familiar. We talked about it being the viscosity of fluid. The thicker it is, the more energy it's going to take to move that fluid. So viscous loss is usually due to a fluid having to overcome its own stickiness to move. So in this example here, you can see all of these cups have different viscosities within them. They're all held up at the same angle, at the same height, so it has the same potential energy working on the viscous fluid found within them. The ones that are barely flowing or not flowing really at all have a lot more viscosity to them. So it's going to take more energy to move that fluid. And because there's not enough energy in the system, it doesn't flow. So when blood is really thick or we have polycythemia, it's going to take more energy for the blood to flow versus blood that's very thin. And another idea that you can kind of think of with that is if you've ever known someone to be on blood thinners, their blood is very thin, it has low viscosity, if they were to cut themselves, they potentially could bleed out because their blood is so thin 
it's just going to flow very easily out of a wound. So viscous loss, blood has to overcome its own stickiness. Now frictional loss, we see this all the time, especially in colder environments. If you're a little chilly and you rub your hands together, you start to feel heat. So friction is probably the most common transformation from the circulatory system and it's transformed into heat. So our circulatory system loses a lot of its energy to heat into the surrounding vessels. Remember when we were talking about parabolic flow, we talked about how the outer streamlines are going to drag along the walls of the vessel. Those are going to cause friction on the next streamline and, and so on and so on. And so we see frictional energy being a very large cause of transferred energy. And again, that is going to be in the form of heat. The third type of loss and inertial loss is going to refer more to how blood has to change directions while it's flowing. And in doing so, it's going to lose some of its kinetic energy. Now, a really good example of this is merging on a highway. Everybody's driving along very fast. All of a sudden, a lane is closed. Well, now, if you live anywhere like I live, everybody is trying to get into the same lane. Traffic slows down. We've lost our kinetic energy because we've got to change directions and figure out how to fit through this area. The lane closure would be very similar to a stenosis in a vessel or in a valve. As the blood reaches it, it's got to kind of slow down, figure out how to rearrange itself, and then figure out how to move through that area. After the stenosis then, just like in changing lanes, once the road opens up, everybody separates out. And depending on how aggressive drivers there are, some will start going really fast. Some are still trying to figure out how to get their car up back up to speed. It gets a little chaotic, possibly after that opening. And that's what we're going to really see in the blood as well. We're going to lose some energy as we reach areas that we need to start to change direction. Uh, we also see inertial loss just in the positivity of vessels. That forward and backwards movement causes kinetic energy to be lost during that motion. So inertial loss is the third type of way that we lose energy via transformation from the circulatory system. Now we've heard the word stenosis a few times. We've talked about it in relationship to turbulent flow, and now we've talked about it in relationship to an inertial loss. So it turns out that a stenosis has actually a really big effect on flow through vessels. So a stenosis is a narrowing of the lumen of a vessel or a valve. And again, that stenosis is going to cause a significant change in the way that blood flows. Looking at these graphics here, a really common space that we see a stenotic blood vessel is in the carotid arteries. The carotid arteries bring blood to our brain. So naturally, we would want a lot of blood always flowing to our brain. But when there's a narrowing, as you can see here in the magnified area, we are going to see blood having a problem flowing through that area. It's going to lose inertia. It's going to start to flow chaotically back here. There's a lot of ways that this stenosis is going to affect the normal flow of the blood. Pathology within the vessels and valves causes blood flow to change and can affect what happens downstream. Over on this side, we have a couple examples of aortic valves. We have a normal one up here, opens and shuts all the way. In aortic regurgitation, which is not quite what we're talking about, but this is a valve that's not closing all the way, so it allows blood to flow backwards. It doesn't close the system quite all the way, and so we start to see blood flowing back into the left ventricle. With an aortic stenosis, it's actually really going to cause the blood in the left ventricle to have a difficult time getting out of the left ventricle, just like blood is going to have a difficult time continuing towards the brain. And the aortic valve is responsible for blood getting to the rest of our body. So this can really cause a lot of issues downstream. Anytime we are narrowing the vessels, we can expect to see changes in how the blood is flowing. And that is significant to ultrasound because we can monitor those changes with Doppler tracings. So what do we see when a stenosis is present in the pathway of blood flowing? Well, there are five things. There are five changes that we need to be aware of. The first one is that blood flow is going to change directions as it flows into the narrowing and then back out of it. So again, we have our blood flowing through the vessel, encounters the stenosis. It has to narrow, change its pathway through here, 
And when it comes out of it, it turns into that chaotic, turbulent flow. So stenosis causes the blood to change directions as it flows into the narrowing and back out. Secondly, we're going to see that velocities increase. Again, we have blood flowing into the stenotic area and then back out of it. The issue is that blood can't slow down here just because it met the stenotic area. We have to keep up the flow rate. Remember we talked about the flow rate for the circulatory system being about 5,000 milliliters per minute. We gotta keep that up. Otherwise, if blood just slowed down here and wasn't making it back to the heart, we're gonna have some bigger issues that we're not keeping blood flowing. We're gonna have blood backing up, not a good thing. So we gotta increase the velocity through a stenosis because we gotta make sure all this blood can still continue through trying to maintain that flow rate. So again, increase in velocity in the narrowing. We're then going to see turbulent flow distal to a narrowing. So remember, we've gone through the stenosis, and when we come out of it, we see that turbulent flow. That again is going to be the vortices and the eddies, the turbulent chaotic flow behind the stenosis. We're also going to see a pressure gradient within the stenosis, and we're actually going to see a decrease in pressure. So blood is flowing through this area. This is a higher pressure over here versus down here. And we know that because blood is flowing this direction. But when we get to the stenosis, we need a pretty severe pressure gradient or high pressure to low pressure because we got to get that blood through there very fast. And so when the pressure decreases, velocity is going to increase to keep that blood flowing at the same rate through that area. So pressure gradient, decreased pressure through the stenosis. And then the last thing that we see with a stenosis, as the blood is flowing up to the stenosis, we are going to see a loss of pulsatility. Remember, we were able to see how the blood reacted to the cardiac contractions. But as that blood gets up to the stenosis, it's almost like a lot of it is kind of hitting a wall. So instead of seeing that pulsatility in our waveforms, what we see is almost blood just kind of hitting a wall and stopping. And so loss of pulsatility, we stop seeing the cardiac contractions having as great an effect on the blood flow. Now what's really neat about ultrasound and stenosis is that we are actually able to detect a lot of these changes using our machine. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about that in the Doppler section. But just to kind of recap, when we use Doppler technology with ultrasound, if we sample in the stenosis, we will be able to see increased velocities on our recordings. If we are to sample beyond the stenosis, we'll see turbulent flow in our Doppler tracings. And then we can also see that loss of pulsatility. If we are coming up to a stenosis and place a sample Doppler before it, we're going to see the pulsatility decrease. And when you see a decrease in pulsatility, you expect a distal stenosis. So these are markers that we see that kind of help us let us know that a stenosis is going to come up or is occurring where we can find the greatest amount of stenosis. And then by using like calculations and numbers from years and years of studying ultrasound information, we can then predict actually how stenosed something is. For example, this leans a little bit more to the vascular side of things, but if we are sampling in the middle of the stenosis, we expect that we're going to have really high velocities. So for frame of reference, a lot of the time blood is flowing um, maybe about, we'll just say 90 centimeters per second. When you're in the middle of that stenosis, you might see velocities 500 centimeters, 700 centimeters per second. And the higher that velocity is, the more stenosed the vessel most likely is. And so we can kind of start to predict, you know, a 300 centimeters might be 70 to 90% stenosed. So by using our Doppler information and our knowledge of hemodynamics, we can start to put the pieces of the puzzle together to really help us understand how the patient's blood flow is related back to a pathology. I think this discussion really lends itself to us taking a moment here and just realizing, again, our knowledge of physics is super important to creating diagnostic images. We just learned about how a stenosis is going to affect blood flow. It's got five things that it's going to do to the blood flow. Three of those things we can detect with our ultrasound machine by using 
Doppler information. We're going to see high velocities. We know that's in a stenosis. We're going to see turbulent flow. We know that's past the stenosis. We know that there's going to be a loss of pulsatility before the stenosis. So when we're interrogating a patient's blood flow, be it in the heart or in the vessels, and we see that loss of pulsatility, we can think, oh, there might be a stenosis coming up. And as we're going through getting our Doppler information, we see extremely elevated velocities. Now you know you're in a stenosis. You're proving there's a stenosis because we learned about the formulas and the hemodynamics of blood flow. So now we're showing, yes, there is a stenosis. And we're going to take it a step further by understanding what's happening in that stenosis. And that is a big reason why we're learning ultrasound physics. It's good to know that velocities increase in a stenosis. It's better to know why it's occurring and what you can do to show and to prove to whoever's looking at your images that you have identified an area of concern that needs to be followed up. So really knowing your ultrasound physics does lend itself to really good patient care. So let's move to Bernoulli's principle. This is the why of velocities increasing in a stenosis and pressure decreasing in a stenosis. Bernoulli's principle tells us that pressure has to be low in a stenosis and the velocity has to be high in the stenosis because we need to make sure that the law of conservation is being followed. So as we have blood flowing through a vessel towards a stenosis, it's going to have different types of energy in it. It's got pressure energy and it's got kinetic energy. Remember the kinetic energy is the actual movement of the blood. The pressure energy is what is kind of the propelling force behind it. So as we're getting up to that stenosis, pressure energy is going to be a little bit higher than kinetic energy. We have blood moving relatively free through the vessel. Now, when we get up to the stenosis, we have to maintain energy through the stenosis. We know that velocities are going to increase, which means we have to have more kinetic energy. The only way we can get more kinetic energy is by converting some of that pressure energy. So pressure energy has to be converted to kinetic. So now we've reduced pressure, increased kinetic, so we can increase velocities. We have to maintain the flow rate so blood can still get back to the heart at the rate that we need it to. So pressure decreases in the stenosis, velocities increase, which means kinetic energy increased. Now on the back side of the stenosis, this is distal. That's where we're going to start to see that turbulent flow, but we start to see pressure energy increase again and kinetic energy reduce again because we are conserving the energy in the system. So again, this is mostly just a representational view of Bernoulli's principle, but we have 10 units of energy here. Six of them are pressure, four of them are kinetic. As the blood flows through the stenosis, we have to convert some of that pressure energy into kinetic. So we still have 10 units of energy in here, but now we've reduced to three pressure and seven kinetic. That's going to cause velocities to increase, pressure decreases. When we get to the outside of it again, conserving energy, we still have 10 units of energy in here, but now we have more pressure energy. So we've returned to six pressure energies compared to four kinetic energies. So again, Bernoulli's principle tells us velocities increase in a stenosis, pressure decreases. That's Bernoulli's principle. Section 18.4, hydrostatic pressure. Moving away from blood flow in a stenotic area, I want to bring us back to the idea that we had a couple sources that caused pressure changes in the circulatory system. Now we talked about the heart being a pump and having the forward moving energy. That was one of the ways. The other one that I mentioned was gravity. And gravity is going to be translated into hydrostatic pressure. And we can actually see that in the hydrostatic pressure formula. So hydrostatic pressure is going to describe the relationship between the weight of the blood, the gravity on the blood, and the height of the blood. So in our formula, we have the capital P representing pressure is going to be equal to the height of fluid, lowercase h, multiplied by gravity, the lowercase g, multiplied by the density of fluid, which is represented by the Greek letter rho, 
which kind of looks like a lowercase p. Because we know our relationship values, anytime we increase height, gravity, or density, we should see an increase in hydrostatic pressure. If we take a step back and just look at hydrostatic pressure from the idea of fluid dynamics, then it's worth mentioning that hydrostatic pressure is in relation to a column of fluid. And in that column of fluid, we know that it's going to be acted upon by gravity, the height of the column, and the density of the fluid within that column. So if we are looking at these two columns of fluid, this fluid is taller, there is more levels of density within it, therefore there's more weight pushing on this bottom part of the fluid compared to this bottom part of the fluid. The ball at the top of either of them has the least hydrostatic pressure. There's really only gravity working on it at this point. The hydrostatic pressure is going to be cumulative as it goes through the column. The pressure of this ball is going to be added to this ball, to this ball, to this ball. And so the fluid is the same idea, that the fluid on top is going to add to the pressure of the fluid underneath it, and so on and so forth, until we have relatively high pressure at the bottom of the column. While humans technically aren't columns of fluid, we do still technically have a height. We're acted on upon gravity, and our blood has density to it. So we do have hydrostatic pressure within our bodies. Now, the interesting thing about hydrostatic pressure, especially when we relate it to humans, is that we want to have kind of a baseline where we consider there to be no hydrostatic pressure. And so for humans, we use the heart kind of as the baseline. So if we're looking at a patient that is standing up and we think of the heart as our baseline, then we are going to say that the heart has zero millimeters of mercury of hydrostatic pressure. This is going to be our baseline. There is no extra pressure in that area. We then know that hydrostatic pressure above the heart is going to be negative. Hydrostatic pressure below the heart is going to increase and be positive. And the further away we get from the heart, we are going to increase even more just like we did in our column of blood. The bottom ball, the bottom fluid, has the most pressure on it, has the most hydrostatic pressure, in fact. So again, in humans, we consider heart to be baseline. Pressure above the heart is negative. Pressure below the heart is positive and increases in pressure as we move to the feet. Our column of blood is getting heavier at the feet. And you may have noticed as well, we are going to use units of millimeters of mercury. That's that mm millimeters. Mercury is abbreviated Hg on the periodic table as our unit for hydrostatic pressure. And this concept becomes important when we think about taking our blood pressure. We use the arm cuff at the level of the heart because we want to know what the true pressure is within the vessels. So we take the blood pressure where we expect there to be zero hydrostatic pressure. We don't have any outside forces on the value that we're getting from that blood pressure cuff. So when we want an accurate blood pressure reading, we try to take it on a sitting patient at the level of the heart. And we do that because the measured pressure that we get with the blood pressure cuff should be equal to the true blood pressure plus the hydrostatic pressure. So again, if heart is zero millimeters of mercury of hydrostatic pressure, then we should be getting a true reading of our blood pressure. So, so far we've been talking about a patient that has been standing or at least sitting in a position in which hydrostatic pressure would be apparent. But what do you think happens when we lie the patient down and the whole body is now at the level of the heart? Now we have created a situation in which there is no hydrostatic pressure added to the system. So now in theory, our supine patient, our lying down patient, has zero hydrostatic pressure added to their circulatory system. So let's take a look at a couple examples. Let's say that we have a patient with a blood pressure of 110. Now this is the very true blood pressure. We somehow were able to like sneak into a vessel, measure the pressure in there. We know it's 110. 
Now we are outside of the body. We are the nurse, the caregiver, practitioner who wants to take a blood pressure on this patient with your arm cuff. So if that patient is lying down, remember that their body is all at the same level of the heart. So that means that there is no added hydrostatic pressure in the circulatory system. And if we know that blood pressure plus the hydrostatic pressure should equal our measured pressure that we get with the blood pressure cuff, then we'll see that if we could put a blood pressure cuff around the head, we should get 110 millimeters of mercury. At the arm, we should get 110 millimeters of mercury. At the thigh, 110. At the ankle, 110. We should see a consistent blood pressure throughout the body because we are not adding any hydrostatic pressure. We're not adding height, we're not adding gravity, and we're not adding density to the column. That's going to change though when we turn the patient into a standing or even sitting position. Specifically in that standing position, we are increasing the hydrostatic pressure. So again, we're gonna say that our patient has 110 millimeters of mercury blood pressure. We just know that's what their pressure is in their circulatory system. We now stand them up and we get out our magical blood pressure cuff and we put it around their head. And because we are taking a pressure above the heart, we are going to have a negative hydrostatic pressure. So we're going to have a negative millimeters of mercury. So we're still going to take our blood pressure, add that negative hydrostatic pressure, and then we'll see that the measured pressure in the head is going to be less than the true blood pressure. Again, that's because we have negative hydrostatic pressure above the heart. Now, if we take our blood pressure cuff and move it to the arm, again, we have 110, just true blood pressure going on. We're adding zero millimeters of mercury because we're at the level of the heart on the arm. Therefore, we're going to get a measured 110 millimeters of mercury for their blood pressure. We then move their cuff down to their thigh. We are below the heart, so we are going to have a positive hydrostatic pressure. So we're gonna take that 110, add the 50 millimeters of hydrostatic pressure, and now we're gonna see a measured pressure of 160 millimeters per mercury. And if we move, finally, our blood pressure cuff down to the ankle, we again are adding even more hydrostatic pressure to the system, and so we are going to see even a higher measured pressure at 210 millimeters of mercury. The big takeaway from this is that when we are looking at measured pressure, that is the reading that you would get from like a blood pressure cuff outside the body. When we are looking at that measured pressure it is affected by the hydrostatic pressure on the body. If we are at the level of the heart, we are not adding any hydrostatic pressure. Hydrostatic pressure is only zero if the patient is supine and that is going to be throughout their whole body or if they're standing, it'll only be at the level of the heart. When we have that standing patient and we're looking at measured pressures, we need to know that the hydrostatic pressure is going to affect the measured pressure. We are subtracting pressure from the system when we are above the heart and we are adding hydrostatic pressure to the system when we are below the heart. And the further we get from the heart, the more the hydrostatic pressure is going to increase. Now you don't need to know these numbers. These are going to be variable from person to person because remember it's gravity, height, and density is how we figure out this number. So again, the big thing that you need to know, negative hydrostatic pressure above the heart, zero at the heart, positive and increasing pressure as we move below the heart. The last section of hemodynamics then is section 18.5, vessel considerations. The vessels and their anatomy do affect some of the blood flow, so we need to understand how the vessel anatomy can change blood flow. Now the circulatory system starts at the heart, and the left ventricle is going to create that pressure and then propels blood into the aorta. And the aorta becomes arteries, then arterioles, and then capillaries. And those capillaries are the very tiniest vessel they're gonna allow for the nutrients and waste exchange to occur. And they're really only big enough to allow one red blood cell through from side to side. Now those capillaries then are going to 
converge into what we call venules. Those are going to converge into veins. The veins become the vena cavas, and the vena cava is going to return to the heart. Taking a brief look at the vessel anatomy then, we do need to know that both veins and arteries are made up of the same layers. On the very, very inside of the arteries and veins, we have the tunica intima. The next layer out is the tunica media. And you'll notice that the size of the tunica media varies quite a bit for the arteries and veins. The arteries have to be able to handle that increased pressure from the aorta and the heart. And so the tunica media on the arteries is a very elastic muscular layer. And that is why we can feel our pulse because we can feel the muscle being stretched out and bouncing around in the arteries. So the tunica media is much thicker on the arteries. And not only does it allow arteries to accept high pressure, but it also is going to allow for some control of the blood flow in the arterial side of things. The outermost layer then is the tunica adventitia, and that is mostly made up of connective tissue. And on our really large vessels, it has something called the vasorum. These are going to be tiny little blood vessels that actually supply the outside layer of the large vessels in the body. One final anatomy note is that the veins actually have valves within them, and they are going to keep blood from flowing backwards. I had mentioned earlier that the arterioles are the tiniest vessel right before turning into capillaries, and that the arteries do have that muscular wall. The arterioles have the capability of what we call vasoconstriction and vasodilation. In vasoconstriction, the arterioles are going to increase the pressure because they are creating a smaller diameter or smaller radius of the vessel. Opposite of vasoconstriction then is vasodilation. In this instance, the muscular wall of the arterial relaxes and that's going to allow for increased flow because now we have increased the diameter or increased the radius of the vessel. So this vasoconstriction and vasodilation is directly related to the flow rate and Passé's equation that we learned earlier. As the diameter of the vessel changes, it's going to change the flow rate. Now the veins of the system don't have the large muscular layer, but they are very flexible tubes. And so the venous system at any point is holding about two thirds of the total volume of the blood in the body. The venous system has something called high capacitance, and that means the ability to hold on to a volume of blood. Because the walls of the veins are very flexible, in a low pressure setting, they're almost going to be completely collapsed upon one another. But as the body needs more volume to return to the heart, they can dilate, therefore lowering the resistance and increasing the diameter, causing the flow to increase. So again, this is really showing us Pazé's law in action. When we dilate the vessel, make it bigger, we're making the radius diameter increase, which will increase the flow rate. Heading into our last concept then on hemodynamics is respiration and venous flow. Now we've been talking about forces that propel the blood forward. We've got the heart contractions and we have gravity. And when we think about arterial flow, we know it has a lot of pressure. It's pushing the blood into our organs through those capillaries. And now it's got to head back to the heart. And we know that the veins take the blood back to the heart. But what's interesting about this is that the blood in the veins is no longer really affected by the cardiac contractions. So how does the blood get back? Well, the biggest concept is that there still has to be a pressure difference to make the blood flow back to the heart. And there is, but it's actually a really, really tiny difference. The venous system has about 15 millimeters of mercury of pressure in it. And the right atrium of the heart, where the blood empties into, has about eight. So there is a very tiny pressure difference. That pressure difference is going to keep blood flowing in the correct direction towards the lower pressure. But there are also some other mechanisms within the body that help encourage blood flow back to the heart as well. The first one that we can see on the screen now are that veins contain valves. As blood is flowing back through the veins, the valves will periodically close, keeping blood flowing in the correct direction. 
And just like the heart acts as a pump for the arterial side of things, we have something called the calf muscle pump. As the calf muscles squeeze, the soleal sinuses, which are kind of like these little cups that hold blood in the veins of the leg, they are squeezed of their blood. That extra pressure, that extra volume into the system is going to help propel blood towards the heart. And then remember those veins shut, keeping that blood moving in the correct direction. The third mechanism that encourages blood flow are changes in respiration. Because as we breathe in and breathe out, we are changing the pressure in the thoracic and abdominal cavities. And the pressure change in the thoracic and abdominal cavities is going to affect the amount of blood flow that is coming in from the veins. But it does this in a very particular way. There's a large muscle that sits in between the thoracic and abdominal cavity, and it's called the diaphragm. And when we inhale, the diaphragm is going to be pushed down into the abdominal cavity. When the diaphragm is down towards the abdominal cavity, that causes a decrease in pressure in the thoracic cavity and an increased amount of pressure in the abdominal cavity. Because there's a decreased amount of pressure in the thoracic cavity, venous blood flow from the arms and the head is going to increase it is easier for that blood to get back to the heart. Because there is more pressure in the abdominal cavity, it makes it more difficult for blood from the legs to return. When the patient exhales, the diaphragm bounces back up into the thoracic cavity. When it goes up into the thoracic cavity, the thoracic cavity pressure increases, and then the abdominal pressure decreases. When the abdominal pressure is lower, that's going to increase the flow from the legs and decrease the flow from the arms and the head. So again, to recap, when we inhale, diaphragm moves down. Thoracic pressure decreases, abdominal pressure increases. Venous flow from the arms and the head increase because it's easier for it to go into the thoracic cavity where the heart is. Venous flow from the legs stops or decreases because it's harder for it to come into the abdominal cavity before getting into the chest. When we exhale, the diaphragm moves back up into the thoracic cavity. This causes the thoracic cavity pressure to increase, the abdominal pressure to decrease. The decrease in abdominal pressure encourages blood flow to increase from the legs, and the high pressure in the chest causes blood flow from the arms to decrease because now it's harder for it to get into the chest. And that brings us to the end of our conversation surrounding hemodynamics. So remember we started out this unit talking about fluid dynamics and Passé's law basically telling us that flow rate is related to the length of the tubes, the viscosity of the fluid, the radius or diameter of the tubes, and the change in pressure or the pressure gradient within the tube. Knowing Passé's formula will be very helpful, but in the end you really need to understand the concepts of what's going to increase or decrease the flow rate. We then learned about the different types of blood flow, laminar versus turbulent. You should be able to describe both of them and what it looks like, what they sound like, what causes them. You also want to be able to discuss the types of flow that we see in arteries and veins, pulsatile versus phasic versus steady. Then you should also be able to describe the ways in which we lose energy out of the circulatory system and specifically how a stenosis is going to change the way blood flows. Remember Bernoulli's principle is very highly linked to blood flow through a stenosis. So you should be able to, in your own words, describe Bernoulli's principle. Next, we talked about hydrostatic pressure. Make sure you understand the difference between a standing and a supine or lying down patient. Why we take patients' blood pressure with them either lying down or at the level of the heart if they are sitting. Knowing that hydrostatic pressure is negative above the heart and positive below the heart. And then lastly, you should be able to describe what happens when we inhale and exhale, how that affects the venous flow and how vasoconstriction and vasodilation can also affect 
the flow rate in the arteries. Remember, you do have activities in the workbook and some open-ended questions at the end of the workbook to double-check your knowledge of the material presented.